Thanks for watching Henry AI Labs. This video explains Chapter 2, Multi Arm Bandits, in Richard Sutton and Andrew Bartow's book, Reinforcement Learning and Introduction. A free PDF version of this book is linked in the description, as well as a print version available for purchase. The purpose of this chapter is to further develop an understanding of reinforcement learning. We've seen this framework of how the agent interacts with the environment through an action, and the environment sends back states and rewards. In this chapter, we're going to look at different ways that the environment can respond to the agent's action in the context of K-arm bandits, contextual bandits, and then how this leads into the full reinforcement learning problem. Also, a big theme in this chapter is the exploration-exploitation trade-off, and how we learn value functions through either greedy action selection, epsilon greedy selection, the upper confidence bound, and then gradient bandits. If you're coming from other disciplines of deep learning and machine learning, studying supervised learning, it's important to frame how reinforcement learning is different. Reinforcement learning is evaluating the actions taken rather than instructing what the correct actions are with the correct set of labels. So in this case, we're looking at the K-arm bandits. Imagine the situation where you have four different buttons to press and you receive a reward for pushing each of the buttons. So you wanna find a way to smartly explore and exploit which buttons to push so as to say maximize the rewards over 100 uh, pushes of the buttons. So the K-Arm Bandits is similar to the button, similar to slot machines with different slot levers to pull, and then a doctor choosing experimental prescriptions for sick patients. The objective is to maximize reward over a given number of time steps. So let's see how the K-Arm Bandits relates to our agent environment framework that we're going to use throughout this uh, video series to understand the reinforcement learning framework. So the agent sends an action, which is whether to push the purple button, green button, red or blue, and the environment sends back a reward. But in the case of the K-arm bandits, contrasting to other reinforcement learning problems, the state is going to be the same exact environments. Uh, the state is going to be the same thing sent back to the agent every time. So every time the agent has these four buttons to push, and it's always going to be the same, regardless of which buttons it pushes. An interesting characteristic of K-arm bandits problem is the distribution of the rewards and how it changes over time. So the reward distribution can be either stationary, meaning that pushing the purple button would have the same expected reward for the first 50 time steps as, say, the next 50 time steps, or it could be non-stationary. For example, the reward distribution changes over time. So one good example of a non-stationary reward distribution could be if you're playing against an opponent in an adversarial game like chess or tic-tac-toe. If you just keep on making the same moves, the opponent might catch on to this and then change its strategy accordingly. Therefore, the reward distribution of making that move is non-stationary. It changes over time. So the idea of the K-Arm Bandit is to maximize a reward. So how do we find the best buttons to push? So the simplest way to do this would just to be to have this estimation of each button's reward as being the sum of the rewards taken when you push the purple, green, red, and blue buttons over the number of times that you've pushed that button. So the greedy action selection rule here would be to take the maximum uh, button value that, that's returned the most reward given by this equation of the number of the reward that you've achieved over the times you've pressed the button. We've just defined greedy action selection as selecting the button with the maximum uh, value function estimated by our agent. Epsilon greedy ac action selection is going to have a probability epsilon of not selecting this maximum utility button, but rather sampling another button to press with uniform dis uh, distribution or uniform probability, meaning that if the purple button has the maximum expected reward, you're going to sample from green, red, and blue all with the same probability of, say, one-third. So as the number of steps increases with the epsilon greedy policy, every action will be sampled an infinite number of times, and this QT of action, which is our uh, Q function, our value function of the action, will converge to this notation of Q star A. So when you see this Q star A notation in reinforcement learning, basically it just means the optimal uh, value function for that action. So efficient sample averaging is one technique introduced in the chapter to have constant memory and constant computation for estimating these uh, average returns for pushing the different buttons. So if you imagine the average, the average over five samples of pushing the green button is eight, you don't need to keep the uh, five returns from pushing the green button five times. Rather, all you need is five and 40 to update the average in the future. And you can see how they derive this with this. Basically, we have this one over n, which is used to weight the uh, return minus the average when you get new samples. But using this idea of the new estimate is the old estimate. So say the average is eight. You would have eight equals eight plus the step size, which in our case of uh, just simple averaging is just one over n. And then you would have the target minus the old estimate. So say we have five samples and the step size is one over five, or not one over six because we have this new sample. We get 12, so we have 12 minus eight is four, 
and then four over six, two thirds, so we have eight plus two thirds is our new average. We just covered the greedy and epsilon greedy algorithms for balancing exploration and exploitation to learn the values of pulling different levers or pushing different buttons in the K-arm bandit problem. Now the book is gonna test these two algorithms on the 10-arm testbed toy problem. So what this is, is uh, the actions represent the different buttons the agent can press, and there's an underlying stationary reward distribution for each of these actions, which is sampled from a normal distribution and then each of the, so each of these actions, the mean is sampled from the normal distribution as well as uh, unit variance. So they each have one variance, as you can see by these normal distributions they have around their central reward. So in this example, this uh, third button would be the optimal one to push and the sixth one would be the worst one to press. This is a comparison of the greedy algorithm versus the epsilon greedy in this 10 arm testbed toy problem. So as we see, the average reward is the best for when the epsilon value is 0.1. This epsilon value dictates how often this uh, exploration algorithm is sampling random actions rather than choosing the action that is learned is the best. So learning, for example, that pulling this uh, third action lever is the best one compared to just testing another action to learn more about the space. We also see in this chart the percentage of the time that each algorithm is selecting the optimal uh, action. So the percentage of times that the algorithm is pulling on this third action lever. There are different situations in which the greedy algorithm is advantageous to the epsilon greedy. In cases where the reward variance is zero, the greedy selection only needs to take the action one time to know the true uh, reward given by that action. But epsilon greedy algorithms do much better when there are noisy rewards, for example having more variance in the uh, distribution away from the mean of the reward on that action. It also performs much better with non-stationary rewards. As the reward distribution changes over time, the epsilon greedy algorithm will actually venture out and see if some of the previously previous actions that are thought to have very low rewards have uh, their reward distribution has changed such that they're more desirable now. So the simple bandit algorithm is this idea of either taking the maximum action with this probability one minus epsilon or taking a random uh, action with probability epsilon and then updating the uh, sample average for that action to update the probability of taking the action. So the adjusting the step size is an interesting thing for when you have non-stationary rewards. So for example, imagine if as we're pushing the buttons, the rewards given by each button is changing over time, like the underlying distribution not necessarily known to the agent is changing over time. So what we do is we have this alpha parameter that is weighting how much we update our expectation of each button we're pressing based on uh, how recently we press the button. So for example, if alpha is one and we have this previous idea that pushing the green button gives us a reward of five and now we get 10, we take this 10 minus five is five plus, times one and now we update the green button to be 10. But if it's 0 0.5 and then we push the green button again and get 10, we don't quite update the expectation of the green button all the way to 10, rather we just update up to 7.5. This idea of unevenly weighting the most recently uh, obtained rewards compared to the overall average of rewards is known as the exponential recency weighted average. So this unrolling of time steps shows how the reward obtained at say uh, step n minus three impacts the current estimate of the reward based on this alpha parameter and the explanation of how long ago it was that you obtained that reward. So you can also vary uh, the step size parameter from step to step, which is something they talk about in the book, but overall I didn't think it was something that uh, has too much rigor behind it. So the initialization of action values is another really interesting hyperparameter of this algorithm. So for example, in the greedy algorithm, you can obtain a better result in the epsilon greedy if you have an optimistic initialization of all of the rewards you get for pushing the different buttons or pulling different levers. So for example, in this case, the rewards have this average around zero. But if you initialize them so the agent believes that they all have a value of five, it will result in exploring all the different actions as it becomes disappointed with the results it's achieving as it's uh, sampling the greedy actions. So strategic initialization is actually often a waste of effort in practice because often we're dealing with non-stationary reward distributions. So things concerning the initial behavior of the agents really don't matter that much for most real problems. UCB is another technique for balancing exploration and exploitation. Epsilon greedy is just randomly selecting another action uniformly after deciding not to take the greedy action. So how could we do a better technique of this and weigh actions based on whether they are almost greedy or if they just really haven't been tested much and there's a lot of uncertainty about the action. So this is done with this equation for the UCB. We have our estimate of the action and then we add on this term, which is the UCB term. So this C parameter weights the uh, balance between these two. 
And the t over the number of times the action is sampled uh, is a metric for how uncertain we are about our estimate of this uh, q, q function for this action. This plot shows that the UCB algorithm with the c equals 2 parameter slightly outperforms the epsilon greedy algorithm with the epsilon equals 1 value, 0.1 value. However, UCB is more difficult than the epsilon greedy to extend beyond bandits to more general reinforcement learning problems, mainly due to non-stationary problem uh, reward distributions and large state spaces, which makes it really hard to estimate this function in a useful way. So another really interesting way of balancing exploration and exploitation is the gradient bandit algorithm. So what we're doing here is we have a relative preference of taking one action compared to the other action. So what we have is a softmax distribution over our actions, meaning that the probability of taking the actions all sum to one. So when we're doing this, we update this with stochastic gradient ascent, taking this update rule, which is our current estimate of the state or our preference, numerical preference that then gets put into that softmax distribution to normalize it into a probability of taking the action is updated based on the reward received, received over the baseline or the average expected reward times the probability of taking that action. The book provides a long derivation showing why we can use this stochastic gradient ascent approximation for the exact gradient ascent, showing the exact differentiation of how changes in numerical preference of this action will, expect, will change the overall expected reward over the course of sampling different actions. So if we remember, changing the numerical preference the derivative with respect to this numerical preference will change the probability distribution over all the actions because you remember the numerical preference goes into this softmax distribution which has an impact over all the actions because it's summing to one. We're going to get more into the details of this when we cover policy gradients but for now we will just quickly look over the exact gradient ascent derivation to the approximation with this stochastic gradient ascent equation. Following this is the idea of contextual bandits. So going from the k-arm bandits to contextual bandits we imagine also having this cloud symbol or an indicator of which slot machine we're about to pull and the lever, the reward distributions for the different buttons changes with respect to which machine we're operating on. So in our general reinforcement learning frame, framework of agent, action, environment, observation, reward, now our observation isn't the exact same state space as every single episode, but now we also have this additional contextual information on which slot machine we're pulling, and therefore the agent has to use this to inform its actions. So now we've seen how contextual bandits extends the k-arm bandit problem by providing this context as to which uh, machine we're in and which slot machine we're pulling the levers of. So going from contextual bandits, the full reinforcement learning problem would be if which button you press determines the next machine that you get, rather than just randomly seeing a new machine. So for example, if we get to the green, uh, if we get to the blue cloud machine, and we push green and it takes us to the green cloud where the purple button receives this massive reward, we then have this uh, state transition that we're interested in leading us to this full reinforcement learning problem. So the chapter also compares the greedy, epsilon greedy, uh, upper confidence bound, and gradient bandits on this 10-arm testbed for the purpose of learning the optimal action to take in order to maximize its reward. And basically, all these algorithms, the high-level takeaway is that they're techniques for balancing exploration and exploitation. Thanks for watching this explanation of Chapter 2, Multi-Arm Bandits in the Introduction to Reinforce and Learning book. Hopefully, some of the big takeaways you got is this idea of transitioning from K-Arm Bandit environments to contextual bandits to the full reinforce and learning problem, and how we see how the influence of uh, actions and leading to new states can change our uh, limitations of the problem. We also saw different methods for trading off exploration and exploitation, like greedy selection, epsilon greedy selection, UCB, and gradient bandits. Thanks for watching, and please stay tuned for more videos covering Introduction to Reinforced Learning. Please subscribe to Henry AI Labs for more deep learning and artificial intelligence videos.